perhaps the annual session of the General Assembly. He's Mr. Rana Singha Premadasa. With me to interview our guest are three journalists. Tazi Vitacci, a columnist for Newsweek International. Pauline Frederick, foreign affairs commentator for National Public Radio. And Michael Littlejohns, the chief United Nations correspondent of Reuters. Our guest today is Rana Singha Premadasa. He was born in 1924 in Colombo, Sri Lanka, in what was then known as Ceylon. Mr. Premadasa is a well-known writer, poet and orator in his country. He's the eighth Prime Minister of the Independent Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka and he assumed that office in February 1978. In addition to being the Prime Minister, he also holds the portfolio of local government, <coughs> housing and construction. In Parliament, he is also the leader of the House. Mr. Prime Minister, we're delighted to have you with us today on this edition of World Chronicle. And here with our first question for you is Michael Littlejohns. Mr. Prime Minister, as you know, there's um, talk of a move to eject Israel, the Israeli delegation at any rate, from the UN General Assembly. And President Carter has served notice that if this should happen, the United States would pull out of the United Nations. What is the attitude of uh, Sri Lanka, your government, to this question and uh, to the whole question of withdrawing representation of uh, member states in the General Assembly, as of course happened in the case of South Africa in 1974 and set a precedent for the possible action against Israel? In an organization like the United Nations, we would like all sovereign states to be represented. In regard to the present situation, we haven't given much thought of it. But basically, I should say that our attitude is that all should get their representation on a world, world body like this. You are, your country is a former chairman of the non-aligned movement. Uh, are you aware of any um, majority position on this question in the non-aligned movement? Has it been discussed at all in the movement? No. Not to my knowledge. This is purely an Arab initiative, as far as you know? I think so. Mr. Prime Minister, um, as we all know, the <coughs> United States has agreed to sell enriched uranium to India without receiving in return any promise of safeguards or India belonging to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Does this give you any concern? As far as India is concerned, uh, we have a lot of confidence as far as matters of this nature are concerned. Uh, Mrs. Gandhi herself had stated that she will be using these energies for peaceful purposes and we can uh, trust her. There is a possibility also that Pakistan has been developing uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, do you know anything about that and has that concerned you? Uh, not very much. In other words, um, what seems to be proliferation of this uh, terrible uh, material in spite of the non-proliferation treaty is going ahead at a fast pace. Many nations are now um, finding this available and, and making some use of it. Unless, of course, they are made use for peaceful purposes. Otherwise, it gives concern for all parties because we are wedded to the policy of peace. But can you be sure these nations that have this material are going to use it for peaceful purposes when they will not agree to give any safeguards along that line or make it possible to have any inspection? It's better to have <coughs> safeguards and it is nothing but fair that they should utilize them for peaceful purposes. Prime Minister, you said uh, yesterday at the General Assembly um, that uh, you would like to see the, uh, the United Nations declare uh, International Year of Housing. That's right. Can you tell us something about the thinking behind that? But it must ob obviously come from your own concerns as Minister of Housing in Sri Lanka. We are all concerned about the quality of life of our people. And basically I think a uh, good sanitary environment and uh, better living conditions make the attitudes of people change for the better. Uh, in fact, uh, in my own country, 
I think half the population live in very uh, insanitary conditions. They, in the towns they live in uh, shanties and slums. In the rural areas too, they are living in uh, very uh, unsatisfactory conditions. So housing is basically a primary need of every person concerned. With a better house, his thinking also will improve to a great extent. I think on this socio-economic question, it was interesting, Mr. Prime Minister, to note that you said in your speech that developing countries should have a greater share of the world's industrial output. I think you said as much as 25% by the year 2000. But surely, uh, I suppose you realize that the uh, present tensions are, uh, are very depressing. They're holding back the North-South dialogue. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on the progress of that dialogue? It seems to have come to almost a halt. Yes, we are not uh, satisfied at all because the progress seems to be very poor, as I indicated in my speech. Unless uh, we have uh, justice and equality among the nations of the world, you can't expect peace. Where would you put the blame for holding it up? I think the developed countries will have to share the blame for it. It is nothing but fair that they must think of others. Mm. Seventy percent of the world's population live in the third world. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Prime Minister, why is it that the developing countries seem to, <coughs> excuse me, seem to place most of the blame for the failure of the UN General Assembly special session on uh, economic development in August and September on the Western countries, as you have just done now, uh, at least on the developed countries, and by that presumably you mean primarily the West, although of course the Soviet Union and some others of, of the Soviet bloc are developed too, um, rather than on OPEC, which um, is largely responsible for the economic problems which now beset the developed countries also. It seems to me that, um, in fact, before the special session began, the ministerial meeting of the group of 77 developing countries came out with a statement which laid the blame almost exclusively on the West. Yes, the developed countries put the blame on the OPEC countries. And the OPEC countries put the blame on the developed countries. <laughs> and uh, we, in the third world, are sandwiched between them. What we are saying, I have uh, shown it in a chart, it's an addendum to my speech. I made to the General Assembly yesterday that more than 70% of the world's population live in the third world and when you see this chart you will see where the prosperity has been kept without allowing it to flow to other countries especially the third world countries but the other countries no, are third world countries too that's right but there is no purpose in putting <coughs> the ball from one court to another without sitting down and talking it out and settling it for the good of all. So what do you think should be done that hasn't been done already? I personally think that the leadership should be taken by the developed countries in this instance. They must come out and set an example to others. In what respect, sir? In respect of uh, sharing the prosperity of the world. With but, others. but their argument is that they're not as prosperous as they used to be because of the OPEC's uh, raising the price of, of uh, very important uh, commodity over the years and continuing to do so. Yes, you can argue like that and go on forever. Nothing will come out of it. it I mean, must look look at my own back. country, the United Kingdom, where they have uh, enormous unemployment problem at the moment. I mean, what the United Kingdom, the United States and West Germany, as you know, were the three Western countries which uh, were blamed primarily for the failure of the special session of the General Assembly. But uh, the, the, certainly in the case of the United States and the United Kingdom, these are, these are two countries which have enormous problems of their own. Rising unemployment, inflation, all the other economic ills that beset the world. You'll see that uh, the consumer market is in the third world countries as far as population is concerned. It is in the in interest of the developed countries themselves to help to improve the conditions of the poorer countries and the third world countries because their uh, manufacturers, manufactured goods will get a ready market in these countries and if the de developing countries have no resources for that, 
it will affect the developed countries in a bigger way. It is in their own interest that they should come out. <clears throat> Mr. Prime Minister, with, uh, with all due respect to your placing the first priority in your program on housing, which sounds very important, <coughs> and uh, expecting really some help from the developed countries, uh, what can you expect from them when their first priority is the arms race? That is why we are urging that they should look at the world realistically. As you say, they are more concerned about armaments. They are spending so much of money, not only in producing them, but also in maintaining them. What we are saying is, why can't you at least spend part of that or utilize part of that to raise the standard of living of the people in the third world countries, in the poorer countries. Even otherwise we don't mind. Let them stop this mad race and utilize that money for their own purposes. And I know there will be a better return to the poorer countries. But each is uh, presumably going ahead with the arms race on grounds of that its own security requires it. How do you uh, convince them uh, that uh, they uh, could be secure without uh, spending so much on the arms race. That is why I said yesterday that the root cause of all these things is uh, dependent on the moral crisis that is prevailing. Prime um, Minister, your uh, your argument that um, the 